welcome. Um, I've been doing, those of you that don't know me probably don't know me. I've been doing webinars with FX Street, I don't know, 12 years. But I think I've been doing premium webinars for the last three or four. So I'm not sure that everybody's familiar with me. My name is David. I am a professional currency trader. And I like to think I, uh, my strategy is principally built around fundamentals, longer term perspective, and then kind of top down looking into things from using fundamentals and then boiling them down uh, into a trade plan for the short term, the medium term, and the long term. And I'm going to try and make this as interesting as possible. Uh, and I highly encourage questions. So if you have something on your mind, by all means, ask it. And I'll circle around to it as much as I can. And FX Street, we've got how long here? 45 minutes, an hour. And I, <clears throat> I urge everybody to stick with me as much as you can because I'm going to build on concepts as we go. All right? And I've got a lot to cover, and it's going to be a doozy. So I hope that you enjoy it. Um, and settle in because we've got a lot to cover okay um <clears throat> i want to talk a little bit about our fundamental picture and for a lot of you you're going to be thinking just show me the money i don't care um and we will build trade plans but i do want to get this sort of financial plumbing out there so that we can consider what's going on all right and i'm going to spend 10 minutes of this and then we'll build some trade plans and i'll show you how it all works in on itself all right like I said fire away with questions I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go all right so we live in extraordinary times all right and for those of you that haven't been following things I want to kind of fill this in quickly all right so here is our current financial plumbing and stick with me like I said it is complex but just uh, you know it's something we've got to get through all right, so here is our current financial plumbing in the United States. And it, um, it's much more complex than this, but I'm going to boil it down, basically. And I do see things moving. I know we just got CPO. Okay, so typically, how things have worked is as follows. Tax workers, government employees, private entities, with matching retirement funds, et cetera, in the United States, have taken their money and the interest rates have been higher than what they are. I'm talking over the last 40 years. They've taken this money, they've plowed it into pension funds, and they've taken that money in pension funds, and they've bought <clears throat> corporate debt, and they've bought the stock market, and they've bought very, very low-risk treasuries and T-bills from the government. All right, but those days, because of central bank, because of zero interest rate policy, ZERP, which you guys would have heard of, is now kind of a thing of the past. So how it's gone is this. This is kind of how this plumbing has gone. All right. <clears throat> We've got all these tax workers. Okay, all these guys. Forgive the art. It is juvenile at best. Okay, we got all these guys. And we got these government entities receiving, taking tax receipts. All right, and these guys take their money and they put it into a pension fund. Okay, now, the interesting thing is that the money that, you know, Joe has put into the fund for 30 years is not the money Joe gets out. The money Joe gets out in his 30-year investment here, the money that Joe gets out is what Susie has put in recently. In the last few years five years okay and it's sort of a massive Ponzi scheme all right now for all this to work these pen I'm talking massive pension funds black rocks of the world three trillion and a ridiculously big all right the way that this has worked is that these guys need to realize seven percent return on investment okay and they take this money and they pile it into, or they used to buy T-bills, but what they do now is they buy corporate debt. Okay, 
And this corporate debt used to be structured sort of something like this. We had a tiny little bit of what they call high yield or junk debt. Okay. And it used to be all sort of triple A stuff about that. Now, by law, these pension funds can only buy investment grade debt, which is triple B or better. Okay. And the triple B market used to be very small too, but it's subsequently grown. And it kind of looks like this. And then this is the A, you know, we'll put triple A at the top here. It's much smaller. But this whole market now is $7 trillion. Okay. And these pension funds used to buy these very, very safe T-bills, 5, 6, 7 percent. But because of zero interest rate policy, they've had to take on exponentially more risk to get the 7 percent. So they've had to buy this high yielding bonds. All right. So you've got the Federal Reserve over here. Okay. You've got the Fed. And they've been pumping in money into these T-bills or treasuries, and these treasuries have been bought by overseas entities, etc. Nonetheless, this free money has been pumped into the economy. Okay, now these companies that have issued this corporate debt, what do they do? They say, brilliant, we are now flooded with money. Okay, and they go over here to the stock market, and they buy back stocks. In the last 10 years, almost 80% of the appreciation in the stock market has come through corporate buybacks. Okay, so these companies, entities, we'll call them companies, they take this, they take this money that they've now issued their bonds, they take this money, they buy stocks, this goes to them, that then expands the equity in their balance sheet, their balance sheet expands, all right? And with the balance sheet expanding, their debt also expands, all right? And these rating agencies take a look at this and go, hmm, I don't know about that because your cash flow hasn't really increased, but you've bought back all this equity and issued all this debt, and these corporate bonds get downgraded a little bit, okay? And remember, our guys over here, these pension funds, can only buy this investment grade debt. So to give you some idea of the gravity of this, AT&T, one of America's biggest companies, all right, carries about $900 billion of triple B debt. The others are GE, Ford, General Motors, and Dell Computers. They make up about, about $2.5 trillion in this triple B debt, okay, all owned by these pension funds, all right? The other thing to consider in the United States is this. We have 9,000 people retiring every day in the United States and will for the next four years. Demographics play a huge part in the economy. Well, what happens when you're retiring, typically. Guys, if I miss your questions, just fire them in there and I'll pick them up. But typically what happens when you retire? Your consumption tends to drop a little bit. Instead of driving that new Lexus, you'll drive the latest Toyota. You'll drive a Camry instead. All right? Instead of spending a million dollars on a house, you tend to downsize a little bit. Okay? So... This little caveat to things here is America has 9,000 people retiring every day and about 4 million over the next few years. Huge upside down demographics, similar to what Japan experienced, similar to what Europe experienced, similar to what China is experiencing, and now the United States. Um, ironically, it's the, uh, what they call the monsoon countries that have very favorable huge young population, that's the likes of Egypt, Iran, Iraq, um, East Africa, the Maldives, a lot of Chinese, that's why the Chinese have been colonizing a lot of these countries is purely on, one, their resources, but two, um, 
they have very favorable consumption demographics. All right, something to think about. Anyway, so what happens if the business cycle, which is effectively ISM, starts to roll over a little bit? All right, and, and I'll show you an ISM chart here in a little bit. But if the business cycle starts to drop, cash flows for these companies will also start to drop a little bit. That's likely to trigger further downgrades here. Okay, in this corporate bond market. This corporate bond market is already teetering. Remember, the junk market is only $1 trillion. The triple B is a three, and above that is also another three. There's only buyers for about a trillion dollars of junk. AT&T by themselves has 900 billion of triple B. If they were downgraded, it would blow up the junk market. And all these pension funds would have to dump their corporate debt. Well, if these guys are selling their corporate debt, that's sending interest rates higher. Remember that there's an inverse relationship between bonds price and interest rates okay so you could see a situation purely based on business cycle where one of these guys gets downgraded and you get this toppling of this corporate bond market thanks to quantitative easing i'm not saying it's imminent you're saying this is something that you're going to start hearing a huge amount about okay and then what will happen then is you get caught in sort of this negative feedback cycle because if this corporate bonds are dumped, these companies have to raise money. How do they raise money? They have to sell shares back into the market. Or they have to lay people off. Well, if they're selling the stock market, Joe Schmo over here who's trying to retire takes one look at that and goes, I want no part of that, and starts dumping his stuff too. And you get caught in this sort of negative feedback loop of, rising interest rates, no buyers in the bond market, and a sinking stock market. We're not there yet, all right? There's something else. Wait, but there's more we need to talk about, all right? There are three basic economies in the United States, the financial economy, the real economy, and the FX economy. Right. I hope you guys are kind of following, and the FX economy, all right? <clears throat> It's when the United States started to drop interest rates in 2008 and pump money into the market, many countries around the world bought dollar-denominated debt. And they thought that they were going to get this dollar-denominated debt. And this is very important because I get asked a lot, well, if, we, if we're printing all this money, why is the dollar not just getting destroyed and here's the answer because China has 20% of their GDP in foreign in or dollar denominated US debt now why would they buy that because there was a little bit of yield left and they thought that with the United States cutting rates and pumping money into the market they would be able to buy dollar denominated debt very cheap and pay it back very cheap in the future. But if this bond market collapses and interest rates start to rise, these huge foreign denominated debt, what's going to happen? We're going to see interest rates rising at the same time as we seeing the dollar potentially strengthen because to pay back this debt, if it's rising, and remember this debt rotates, it's like an it's like an adjustable rate mortgage. For this, for them to pay it back, they have to sell their domestic currencies and buy dollars. That's confusing. They have to buy dollars to pay back the dollar denominated debt. That creates huge dollar demand. Argentina has more than 50% of their GDP based on dollar denominated debt. Okay, so if interest rates start to go up, and we see, we're going to see this knee-jerk for several months bubble of dollar strength, that could seriously blow people away. 
I'm going to get to, this is all, there's a question about, well, how do I mix this fundamental and technical? Well, it's all going to, I'm going to bring it all back to something that makes sense here shortly. I know it's a, I know it's a mince right now, but bear with me and I promise you I'll draw this back. Okay. So it's possible that if we start to see some chinks in this corporate bond market, that we're going to see serious dollar strength. I could see us having inflation kicking the country because remember, our real economy is different to our financial economy. And while this debt's trying to get paid back from everybody from these outside entities, it creates huge dollar demand on a short-term basis. And the only way that the Fed is going to do something about that is like what Volcker did back in the day with the Plaza Accord and basically devalue the dollar. And to devalue the dollar, they're going to have to print dollars. You think they've printed dollars now? They're going to print dollars like you've never seen and send those abroad to people to pay back this dollar-denominated debt, which is ultimately going to devalue the dollar on the long term and push gold through the roof. Okay, So this soupy fundamental picture tells me medium term dollar strength, long term dollar weakness. All right, now I know that's a lot of jargon and whatever, and we can have, I mean, we can do an entire hour on one tiny little component of this, but we don't have the time, so bear with me. All right, but I want to also wanted to show you this. This is um, what I was talking about the business cycle is. <clears throat> There's two, two charts I wanted to show you. One is ISM. This is effectively the business cycle, and you can throw out probabilities. Um, yeah, Peter, I know it's confusing, and I'd like to revisit with you guys and kind of elaborate because this is a very, I mean, a, this is probably very confusing on the short term. All right? So this is our ISM. This is effectively our business cycle, and notice these gray areas are recessions. When recessions hit, we generally drop about 50% of the stock market, and you see all those beautiful yen and funding currency repatriation flows we like. All right, but I, I thought I'd point this out. Notice where we are here, teetering around the 80% mark of ISM. And remember, this is what I'm talking about. If the cash flows of those companies start to drop, to raise money, they have to then dump stock or people. And the American economy is based on debt, confidence, and asset prices, not based on anything that's particularly real. Okay? So this is something I'm watching like a hawk, and you should be as well. Now, <clears throat> the other thing, too, that I wanted to point out is this. And you guys can, um, is our 10-year rolling returns of the S&Ps. And notice how this is definitely cyclical. This is going back all the way to 1940. In other words, if you take a section in time, you can see what you would have made on the S&P 500. And what I wanted to point out is that if we take in the high, we're not there. Definitely cyclical, right? Incredibly. So what I could see is a bubble, a melt-up on the stock market, something that we can't even fathom. And it's all just related to the cycle and what we're seeing on ISM and that dollar strength I'm talking about. Anyway, a lot of concepts there. Let me post our website here, and you can have a look at those charts for yourself you go crazy anyway all right so let's talk about our dollar plan so if we're talking about a medium term dollar strength and a long term dollar weakness we can build a plan around that well i mean that the, the the idea there peter is that you know let's say you got china Okay, and let's say they bought, 
you know, a trillion dollars of of dollar denominated, you know, one T here of dollar denominated debt. And let's say they bought that at 2% and interest rates rise a fraction, say 4% based on the financial economy and velocity of money. Because I think we could see inflation just based on velocity of money because of the corporate bond market unwinding. Remember, you don't get, you can have a lot of money in the system, but if it's moving slowly, you don't get inflation. But we've seen the dollar appreciate over the last 10 years, 15%, and we've seen, and we've seen inflation rise. So people are like, oh, the dollar getting strong. We're not going to see inflation. That's hogwash. And we've seen the stock market rise. So we can see dollar going up and inflation start to rise in which case interest rates are going to rise. So the debt service on this money increases a bunch. So China would have to effectively sell their domestic economy and buy dollars at an increased rate to get rid of this, to service this debt, which rolls over on an adjustable basis. Does that make sense? So that creates dollar demand. You know, the other thing that nobody really talks about is China ran a current account surplus for many years with the United States. In other words, more dollars were going to China than were going to the United States. And then they would take these dollars and they would buy this stuff. Okay? Because there was some yield there was safe debt and they wanted to keep the US economy going for their own consumption. Well, because of trade wars and a slowing economy, they're actually running it and Few people know this, they're running a current account deficit with the United States. Which means that there's actually more dollars going this way. All right, now what China's done is they said, okay, well, we're going to do is boost our domestic economy, and they're going to do that through principally debt, but also by infrastructure growth. So what did they do to to build bridges and power fuel? power stations, et cetera, what do they do? They have to get dollars, literal physical USDs to buy commodities because the dollar is a reserve currency of the world. So to grow the Chinese domestic economy, they're no longer getting enough dollars, physical dollars from the United States. So this is creating a dollar shortage. This is one of the reasons why the dollar is not capitulating despite the Fed printing money. So they go to Australia and they're like, we'll buy coal. And Australia says, great, give us some USDs. So to grow a domestic economy, they need dollars. And there's actually a dollar shortage based on Chinese demand for um, commodities to grow a domestic economy. Another reason why we're seeing all this dollar demand, which nobody seems to talk about, but it makes perfect sense. Anyway, so let's route this back to how we can build a trade plan. now. That said, the Fed is printing and have printed $600 billion in the last three months, which is absolutely, you know, B-A-N-A-N-A-S, bananas. All right. However, they're doing it. And I think on the short term, people are going to look at that, and that is going to spawn some dollar weakness. You know, the other thing, too, is if we pull up a dollar chart here, let me drag this across. So the fundamental picture on the short term is dollar bearish. Medium term, tons of dollar strength and the very long term dollar weakness. So now we have a fundamental picture and we can build trade plans around that. All right, so here's our dollar chart. And if we cruise to monthly, let's come way out here. Look at the, um, thanks Cliff. So nice to hear from you, by the way. So look at the resistance that the dollars come up against. And remember, the dollar index is 60% euro. So really, it's the reciprocal of the euro chart, but I'm just using this for generic purposes. So we could look at that and say, okay, big area of long-term resistance. That should spawn a move of at least sort of 50% drop of that little rise, I would think. Well, that takes care of our short-term dollar, you know, short-term dollar bearish bias. Okay, so let's have a look at what that means on a euro chart. 
remember, everything's fractal, right? So if you have, and fractal means a lo, you know a small. The analogy for a fractal is if you have a painting, you can see in a tiny speck of that painting, or a single pixel of the painting, you can see every detail of the larger painting in that single picture or single pixel, a Mandelbrot map type concept. Okay, so if we have a long-term area of resistance, okay, that should potentially say prices risen to that long-term area. That should mean uh, 382, 50% pullback of that long-term area. Well, on the short term, that could mean three months in a certain direction, but all it's doing is pulling back 40, 50% on the long-term basis. And I think that's sort of the context that we're in now as far as this dollar index. So let's look at another euro chart here. All right. Let's look at our daily. <clears throat> so... We've come down a mile. We had this big bounce sort of 2017, and it ran into this buzzsaw of resistance and dropped. However, we've also we've also found ourselves in this cluster of price here. Okay, you know, rangey. If we can kind of measure that as about a 300 pip range. And if you zoom in just a fraction more on the daily, we've been in this little pullback here on a daily basis, but making a series of higher lows and higher highs in that cluster of price area. Okay, now, by virtue of what we're seeing with the Fed on the short-term basis, I think that we can look at sort of something along these lines where we rise towards at 114. Okay, at which point we then gonna be into something like this. Remember we talked about that dollar strength situation kicking in. Well I think that this is what that represents. All right. And then we could see something as far as parity, the 102s, 103s. So we have, from a fundamental basis, a short-term dollar bearish bias, medium-term dollar strength, long-term bearish. Well, let's deal with the short-term. Okay, a short-term, we've got a little change of trend here on a daily, weekly basis. I think that we can build plans around that to buy you know, 110.20, 110.30, all the way into the 109.20 area and try to take that up towards 114. We're going to know very quickly if it's wrong. If it starts breaking below 109, things are wrong. So you got, you know, 100 pips of risk for 500 pips of profit. Um, that is... Um, that's kind of how I see that one going. If it's wrong, well, then we're going to have to rethink it and, you know, we're heading down towards one of us. But I think we're going to be okay on that. Um, monthly stochastics kind of pointed up. And the daily, this is looking like a candidate for sort of something like that. And I could see us stepping down here towards this 110.20 into the early 109s. And that's why you see my little red dot here where <clears throat> this would be a pullback of this drop and up to this resistance. And you can see that, you can see the stuff here. And that's 111.60, that's weekly M3, and then weekly S2 pivot point is 10.16, which is a pretty good looking support zone. So I could see us kind of pushing down towards there. All right, a little something like this. And then we look for that sort of short-term buy towards 114. All right, does that, does that make sense on a trade plan basis? And then going out to the longer term, you know, so then what I like to do is this sort of thing. You know, if we 
hit it up there and we'll be going up for two or three weeks. You know, then you can start drawing down to a daily and a four hour and start to look at the price action around there. And you're going to see, you know, you're going to see sort of something like this develop on a daily. I mean, that's how head and shoulders come about is you, you make these little lower highs, low lows, you break that low, you return right back to the scene of the crime. And off we go. And this sets up very low risk sort of trades for huge awards. So I'll draw it out for you on the way I see this going. So very short term. One, one eleven sixty. So, you know, we'll call it one. Oopsie. And twenty. And then, you know, I'm gonna call it. It's not really a short, short term. It's kind of a a couple for a couple of weeks. Um looking for anything around 110 and maybe a slightly bit below it. We'll put 109 sort of 50. And I think that this is the meat and potatoes trade up to 114 area. And now we into the medium term dollar strength based on all those fundamentals I've told you about. And now we're talking about sort of 115, maybe even 115.50. All right, taking us all the way down towards 100. I think it's going to surprise. I, I, I really think that this dollar strength thing could get out of control to the point where it becomes a massive problem. Um, you know, we're talking big, big dollar bubble, and that will bring gold down towards the scene of the crime again, around 1350, 1400. And... Guys, if you're not buying gold in the 13s, I can't help you, man. You know, I mean, the one, the, the gold is the big beneficiary long term. Now, the problem with gold is actually holding it. It's expensive. But on the long term basis, whew. I will absolutely get to some pound that is my favorite. All right. So, and then, you know, long term, I would think. Up she goes, but we'd have to um, we'd have to play the, you know that's months and months away. Okay, any questions on this? If you guys disagree with me, that's cool. Um, these are my plans, and then I like to sort of narrow them down on the short term. So all I'm doing is using fundamentals, taking long term, short term support and resistance, and balancing it between them based on that overall picture. All right, now let's look at the pound. Yeah, and I think I think that'll work well. You know, you might have to sit through something back towards 111.70, 111.80, but I think overall you're pretty good for 100 pips there. Okay, so let's talk pound. I am the consummate pound bull. I If somebody said to me in two years from now, David, do I think that, 120 and change is a nice buy on the pound, I would say yes. The, I, I just think that the British pound got disproportionately beat up with Brexit. It's not over. There's going to be some lag, but I think just having some resolution to it will largely clear the pound a little bit. Now, they just had terrible GDP data the other day. The data's not good, but I still think that the pound has been devalued disproportionately relative to where it was at the highs and also its fundamental picture irrespective of Brexit. And, I mean, we can talk about the merits of Brexit forever. Anyway, nonetheless... All right, here's our pound longer term chart. And if we grab a fib quickly of, yeah, I'm not as bearish. I, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not bearish like the rest of the world is on the pound. I, I think that 
yeah, like I said, it's like nothing ever seems as good or as bad as it is, and I really feel that way about the pound. All right, now, that said, monthly, we're coming off the 618, big resistance, 135 psychological level. This was the peak high on, and we've been long for a while, this was the peak high of the post-election victory for Boris. Um, I'll have a look at the pound yen. It's not my favorite at the moment, but I'll I'll uh, take a cruise over there for you, sure. Um, <clears throat> so this was the election high, okay? And I'm still very bullish here. The, the thing for me on a monthly basis, it did breach this high. Now, it hasn't closed above there, but we did make a marginal higher high. All right, at the same point, we likely to see, based on this little weekly change of trend direction here, that our support zone is very likely to hold at least once. And I think this is probably enough support that we're going to take the pound. Um, I have a, a quant that I use that in, is part of the company. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm always analyzing stuff myself. But yes, you can look at our stuff here. It's free. And my email is this. Email me anytime you want. I'm happy to share any of the information. Okay, so... We're coming off that 618 of the longer term, but we have all this support lined up here towards sort of the 27, 28 zone. So I think that admittedly we've sort of come to this stuff. So I think that pound is trying to step its way down towards that 127. All right, so I could see us doing this. Short-term support. Okay. A lower high based on that long-term resistance. Okay, and we know our support zone is sort of through here. So I could see us doing something like this. We'll pull back. And uh, this week's weekly central pivot is 130.94. I could see us bouncing back there and then pushing down here. So my short-term plan is actually just short um, one sort of 30.60 to 30.100 and then trade it down towards this 27.60. I am not married to that short because I am, am, I am a pound on bull on the, on the whole. So I don't... Any shorts, any shorts that are taken are very superficial, short-term, you know, get in, t try to get some money and get out of it. It's not something I want because I don't, I don't want to be sit sitting in a situation where I'm trapped in a short wanting to be long. You know, that's not, that's not the priority here. But so my idea then is to long this 127 to 126 all the way up to 140. And then I think we could come all the way down to 120. So. My trade plan there would be sort of call it 130.80 to 127.50. And these all kind of, these are not specific, specific. I'd have to narrow them down as things approach, but that's my short term idea. Medium term is, and this one I feel good about, sort of the 127, 27.50 area and trying to take this somewhere towards 138 and then get out the way because I think she's coming down after that, probably a good bit of 1,500 pips. But I do like particularly this one on a short-term, medium-term basis. You know, you've got, you got all that, you got all this support in your favor here. You got a little directional change, you got a little bit of Brexit optimism, 
you know, this is likely to hold at least once the zone. And that should be enough that we mess around there for a while and then kind of take us up here and then hello. But that's still a decent looking trade in my mind. Pretty limited risk. You got a lot in your favor on a technical basis. Guys, you got to remember with trading, it's just probabilities. I'm not saying you're always going to make money on the probability, but getting as many probabilities in your favor as possible is ultimately um, getting as many things put in your favor is ultimately what's important. Yeah, you're just trying to stack things up. All right, so pound yen was an extra request. Like I said, this isn't pound yen's not my bread and butter at the moment because I think that we've got a few conflicting magisteria here. One, I don't think the technical direction on a longer term basis is clear. Um, and I'm expecting about 150 pip, 150 point stock market drop. But I don't think that the yen is going to drop proportionate to the stock market drop. So we could get all mixed up. I mean, gold short term, I think I'll have a look at gold. It's complex. Um, I mean, I'm just a raging gold bull, but I do think it's probably going to retrace. Give me a moment. I'll I'll run through this and go and have a look at that chart for you. I'm sort of I I don't really have much interest in trading gold on the short term. I'm more about trying to buy it in the 14s and 13s and silver, particularly. I think that silver is drastically undervalued relative to gold. I can show you empirically what that I can show you empirically what that looks like. How often I trade in a week? It could be twice a day. It could be twice a week. It could be twice a month, just depending on how things line up. I would say, you know, a trade or two a week, maybe. Always looking at stuff and moving things around, but, uh, you know, less is sometimes more. All right, so pound yen. I mean, my bigger issue here is this. You know, we're running into this zone, but it's kind of a soft zone. Look at where the wick was relative to where those candle bottoms were. That's a good bit of, bit of 800 pips. Um, <laughs> and now you've got, this, you've got this base on the bottom. You're running into that longer term resistance, but it's a soft resistance. So I'm making it a zone. Boy, this, I mean, it's tough. I, I I feel like the edge is diminished on this pair a little bit. Euro yen or actually dollar yen looks a little clearer to me. You know, ultimately, ultimately, I think you're going to be okay with something that looks like this. Let me have a look at that daily. And the edge here is just the edge here is just tough. I, I I don't see a clear picture, honestly. Lots of junk. If you had to force my hand at a trade based on the long term resistance and this sort of lower low here into the support, I think that I would probably short one forty four, trying to take it down to thirty nine. One thirty nine, but I'm not that's tough don't you know what i mean i hate to be uncommittal because that's not why we're here we had to you know build some trade plans but i don't think the edge is as crystal clear on that you always look for trades at <clears throat> um no i i gareth i like to um I like to have a very clear bias as to what I want short term and what I want medium term and obviously long term. So ideally, I'd like to have a long term core position and then trade around that. So on a short term basis, it can be a couple of days or a day. On a medium term basis, that's typically about a month to six weeks. 
<clears throat> so it really just depends whether I think that, you know, for instance, I think that on the whole, euro is going from 110 or 109.50 to 114. So if I'm shorting it, it's my le least preferable trade, and that one has to work almost immediately, others I have no interest in it. But then the medium term trade up, that one I'm probably going to sit in in a few days and look for multiple buyers on the way on pullback. So it could drop within the context of that medium term move, and then I'm looking to trade that medium term move with several trades. This whole fractal thing can get very convoluted. Yeah. Gold, and then we'll get out of here. <clears throat> I hope, uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Let's have a quick look at these medals. You know, this is something you might want to refer to here. Is, I, I, I think that if, you are, if you're a medals bull, um, silver is actually a better proposition. Look at the silver miners. Look at how tightly correlated we were here. You know, I mean, super tight correlated for years. And now look at the crocodile's mouth here. Silver has really disjointed itself from gold, and I think that the mean reversion is going to happen here. In other words, if you're medium-term bullish on gold, you might want to look at silver. I'm not saying short gold, but certainly, you know, look at silver as an opportunity to maybe overweight yourself if you're going into a gold trade. Make sense? Because, uh, you know, you could see silver, oopsie, you could see silver, you know, buying that in the 16s and taking it up into the 20s, where you buy gold and maybe at 14 and change and take that up to 17. It's going to be a disproportionate move with silver just because of the mean reversion. Mean reversions are some of the easiest, best trading going. Look for disparities of correlation and then trade them back to the mean when it makes sense. I mean, it really is some of the easiest trading going. I think that we have run into this. Pound shorts, Cliff. Some euro shorts based on euro pound and euro Aussie. USDN short, core long position in the pound, looking to add. Anyway, we've run into the stuff on the pound, I think, that or oh, gold. I think we are going to see about a 100, 150 point drop in the stock market that will push gold up a little bit. But I think that we'd like to see a lower high here and a return down. So if you had to force my hand on a gold trade, I would probably be shorting sort of 1580 looking for a hundred dollar drop. But ultimately I'm a long term to me to me gold is uh, more attractive on the long term and trying to pick up something here in the fourteen to thirteen fifty and then taking that up you know into the thousands. We covered a lot here, kind of, I fed you with the fire hose on the fundies and the tentacles, but I wanted us to cover a lot of things. Um, and we're going to do, uh, I think this will be recorded, right? Yeah, I think so. So <clears throat> what we're doing from now on is I'm going to alternate months between a premium webinar and this one. And so... Um, I will see you guys in a couple of months. And by all means, email me. Um, um, by all means, email me. And we will, I will um, share any information. And also, like I said, I'll see you in a couple of months. It's David at SFO hyphen capital. Or you can follow me on the twit at f at uh, forexdavid f o r e x d a v i d.
Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, FX Street. And I had some technical difficulties before we came on here, and it was stressful there for a moment, but we fixed it. See you guys.